Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel for my top 10 favourite historical fiction novels. It feels like ages since I filmed a sit down video because it has been about three weeks for me. My past few videos haven't been in this style because my mum's been having her kitchen done so it was just impossible <laughs> to film in the house properly but I'm excited to just sit down and chat to you about some books I love. Um, I've been meaning to film my top 10 favourite historical fiction novels for a while now. I checked with you recently on Twitter what you'd most like to see. The options were between this, top 10 thrillers and top 10 memoirs, so let me know which one you want to see next. And this obviously won, so you know what historical fiction is. It is fiction set in the past. I have specifically narrowed this selection down to books that were written um, long after the period they're set in, so there's not classics in this video, say books that were set in the 1800s but also written in the 1800s, they have to have been written after that period, so the author cannot have been alive in that period for them to make it onto this video because I do want to do a separate video on classics. There are a couple with speculative elements, but although there are speculative elements in some of the latter ones, they still very much read like historical fiction and that is the primary genre I would give them and who I would recommend them to. I would recommend them to readers of historical fiction. But yes, without further ado, let's crack on with my top 10 historical fiction novels. So I thought I'd actually start off with the most recent book to make it onto this list because it's somewhat reinvigorated my love of historical fiction. With all genres really I go through phases of being super into them and then not reading them for a while but I very recently read The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Mass which is a novel that was originally written in French and has now been translated into English which is the language that I read it in recently and since reading it it's really made me want to pick up some more historical fiction because it reminded me why I love it and what I love in my historical fiction. It's not a terribly long novel either so it's really quick to get through and it's also just very compelling. The way the narrative runs makes it very difficult to put down and I found myself reading it in the space of two days which is quite rare for me. I don't typically read books that quickly. It is set in 19th century Paris at an insane asylum for women. However, as with much of the treatment of women's medical conditions and particularly women's mental health, in these periods a great number of these women were not ill, they just did not adhere to society's standards for women. They say didn't act in a way that their families liked or they weren't heterosexual or what have you and that ended them up in this place and it is based on a true place although with fictional characters. And we follow a selection of different women including the uh, female sort of warden of this institution, the sort of head nurse of this institution who so very much believes in its purpose but has to question that as the narrative goes on. We follow a woman of the upper echelons of society that can see ghosts and then we also um, hear the perspective of some of the women who are incarcerated in this place because it is effectively an incarceration. They have no choice but to be there. It's not um, somewhere you can leave if you want to. And it is, like I said, such a compelling narrative. For a book that's only around 200 pages, I just felt like there was so much within it. We get multiple perspectives and again that that feels like is going to be um, a lot in a short space of time. Like how can you explore so many different women's perspectives in such a short book? But it's done so well. I really felt like I was taken back to this point in French history but also in the history of women because this is something that happened across the world not just in France and I would highly highly recommend it. It's also very beautifully written and very well translated. We then have The Wonder by Emma Donoghue which is another novel set in the 19th century but this time in Ireland uh, and we follow a nurse, a woman that has been employed to come all the way to Ireland from England to observe a child, a young girl who is said to have been blessed by God and no longer requires food. So supposedly this child hasn't eaten for months yet is still alive um, and the church and the medical community don't know what to believe so they have hired both our nurse and a nun to keep watch on this girl at different points in the day so she's never left entirely alone in order to establish whether what her and her family are saying is true or not. This is actually based on a real phenomenon that 
that uh, took place in the 19th century where young girls were supposedly surviving without food and it was considered a religious miracle and it was an incredibly compelling book. This was a complete page turner for me. It is one where you enter into the narrative with a lot of questions because what is going on with this young girl, what's going on with the community and her family and also who is our narrator but as you believe you be but as you feel as though you're starting to get answers to one mystery it just feels like a new one is introduced and you're constantly filled with questions like I thought oh okay okay I get where we're going I understand now no wait there's what uh, that was my experience of this whole novel. I'm a big fan of Emma Donoghue's writing. It's some of the most compelling uh, contemporary writing I have read. I love a lot of her books and she writes in a lot of different genres and this is such a good example of that because I just could not stop turning the pages. It's mysterious and atmospheric and it also gives you a protagonist who you can really grow attached to and invested in because we follow, like I mentioned, this nurse who is observing the child and she has her own story and her own history and her own path to follow and I really enjoyed going along on that journey with her. We then have The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. So yes, this book is inspired by Greek mythology but it's the only Greek myth retelling on this list because I feel that a lot of Greek myth retellings I have a lot of fantastical mythological elements in them whereas Pat Barker very much takes a historical approach to her interpretation of Greek mythology and specifically Homer's Iliad. So this is a retelling in part of Homer's Iliad. It is set during the Trojan War but instead of the perspective being the male soldiers or predominantly the male soldiers at this war, we hear from Briseis who's a Trojan princess that is taken captive during the war and enslaved by the Greeks and it's her story. It's her story as the slave of Achilles, as the slave of Agamemnon, uh, the mistreatment of her and other women during wartime and Pat Barker is predominantly a historical fiction writer so for me reading Pat Barker's book was almost as though I was reading a historian imagining through genuine evidence and study of what women's experiences of war has been like throughout the centuries of a woman in ancient Greece, if that makes sense. I feel like I lost track of my sentence there, but it felt very real to me and it felt like Pat Barker wasn't just retelling a myth, she was also exploring what women's experiences of war would have been like in antiquity and it felt very very real. She also explains a lot of the mythological elements through natural phenomenon in a very real way so although there are touches on mythology and gods and references to them it feels very grounded in reality and it feels very much like historical fiction and Briseis is a fascinating character who I loved getting to hear from directly. It was such an incredible book to me as an ancient historian but also I think to anyone interested in historical fiction and sort of feminist looks at history and mythology. Absolutely brilliant. We then have a book which falls into both the historical fiction genres and the magic realism genres and that is The Passion by Jeanette Winterson. So Jeanette Winterson often brings an element of magic realism to her novels. She very rarely writes purely in the realism side of things. She writes historical fiction, she writes contemporary fiction, she writes science fiction, but there's always a touch of something unusual and strange to it. So even when, like in this book, you are watching events unfold during the Napoleonic Wars, there's just this air of magical realism. Like, that is the only way I can describe it. It is surreal and fascinating and captivating and otherworldly, although set very much in a historical period and about historical characters. So in this novel we follow a young man who is serving in the French army during the Napoleonic Wars and it's his story. It's his story of who he meets, the other soldiers, his absolute and fervent commitment to Napoleon but then also the doubts that come with that, his story of love and falling in love and the twists and turns his life takes is truly stunning. Jeanette Winterson is one of my favourite writers and she's writing a, a few books that could have made it onto this list including Sexing the Cherry which is another historical magical realism novel that I love by her but there's just something about her writing which is absolutely delicious to my mind. Like I cannot consume enough of it and I've adored almost every book I've ever read by her and they really really take me away to another period in time but also away from this world because of that sort of magical 
element and I would highly, highly recommend something like The Passion if you're interested in both historical fiction and magic realism. Right, where was I? I just had to uh, go and charge my camera battery, so <laughs> um, I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start back again at the beginning of the book I was telling you about when I was so rudely interrupted. But that is The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter by Theodora Goss. So this is an interesting one because it's a retelling of sorts of a variety of classic gothic horror novels from the 18th and 19th century. So it's not really a retelling because <laughs> all of the events of this book are set after most of the events in the original books but it is taking characters inspired by or descended from the characters in those books. So for example within these pages you will find characters either from or related to characters <laughs> from Rappuccini's Daughter, The Island of Dr. Moreau, Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and even Sherlock Holmes, which as a massive Sherlock Holmes fan, I'm sure you're not surprised here, I absolutely loved. But predominantly who we are following are the daughters of the monsters or mad scientists from these books. So for example, we have Dr. Jekyll's daughter, we have the daughter of Dr. Moreau, and so on and so forth. And it takes place after the passing of the protagonist's father who is the daughter of Dr. Jekyll and her discovering that she may in fact have a sister or her father may have been hiding things from her and that she is maybe not alone in her relationship to a slightly strange, eccentric and potentially dangerous man of science in this period. It's set in the 19th century and it is a combination of feminist takes on classics often written by men uh, that maybe, you know, dismiss the female characters or what have you, as well as a mystery novel and a novel about found family and friendship in the 19th century because we follow a bunch of women in this story and they all come together and it's brilliant. I absolutely loved it. I loved every single personality and character within these books and you hear a little bit from all of them because it is being written as if one of them is writing down their story and sometimes they interrupt to add things to the narrative and it has that sort of number of layers when it comes to the way in which it is, is written and it's really fabulous. I really need to read book two because it also has elements of Dracula in it as well as following the characters from the first book and I want to know what is next in store for them but overall I just adored book one, loved all the characters, loved their connections to the original classics but I will say that I don't think you need to have read those classics, especially not all of them, in order to enjoy this book because I haven't read all of them, I've read some of them but I hadn't read all of them so I had some prior knowledge um, but in other ways I had lots of gaps and I found that I would also be interested in reading some of those books since reading The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter, particularly Rappuccini's Daughter, which I'd never even heard of beforehand. I then want to give a shout out to a book which is a stand-in for an entire subgenre of historical fiction because if you know me and you've been following me for the past couple of years you know that I am super into historical romance. It's my favourite subgenre of the romance literature genre, particularly your Regency and Victorian era romances. I love romance novels set in the 19th century. I can't exactly pinpoint why but I'm an absolute sucker for them. But I didn't want to include multiple of those kinds of books here because it may or may not be for you and I've also done a video on my top 10 romance novels a number of which are historical. So if you want to know my favourite historical romances, you can go to that video. But if you just like one recommendation for the time being, I have to mention Tessa Dare. Because Tessa Dare is the author that both cemented my love of the historical romance genre, but really just romance in general. She made me so excited to read more romance. She made me face up to and question my own preconceived notions and misconceptions about the subgenres and perhaps the internalised misogyny that I was perpetuating when faced with that genre and really just reinvigorated and changed my reading life because since then I've fallen so completely head over heels. And she's also the romance novelist that I've probably read the most by. So there's two that I usually suggest people start with, but for the sake of this video I will mention the one that I didn't go into detail on in my favourite romance novels video so that you have something a little bit different. And that's A Night to Surrender which is book one in the Spindle Cove series. So what I love about this series in particular is that they're all set in Spindle Cove 
which is this seaside village where women go to um, escape the excitement and overstimulation of the city life. So perhaps they have had one too many seasons in London and can't deal with the marriage market any longer. Perhaps the marriage market can't deal with them because they're a little bit outside of the norms of what women are expected to be of that time. And they go to Spindle Cove to recuperate, to meet other women, to take some time to themselves. And you meet such an incredibly fun cast of characters whilst at Spindle Cove. Every single book in this novel follows a different woman and her romantic journey but also her journey of like self-expression and self-appreciation which I love. It's doubly layered in that way. And in book one, A Night to Surrender, we particularly follow the aristocratic young women who set up, who set up the holiday home at Spindle Cove where these women come. So she is the facilitator of this entire community and it's absolutely fantastic. And in the rest of the books we have women including geologists and barmaids and music teachers and it's so fantastic. Absolutely love these stories. Returning to some of the themes I touched on in The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter, however, is another book which takes inspiration from classics and particularly gothic horror classics in the form of Frankenstein, which is Poor Things by Alistair Gray. So this is a book that retails and draws on the themes of Frankenstein in a new and interesting way. In this story, the monster is a little bit different because it's a young woman whose body was found after she drowned herself and she was pregnant when she drowned herself. And the doctor in this story uses her body and the brain of her unborn child to bring her back to life. So it's also a really interesting and disturbing commentary on the infantilization of women, the fetishization of women and innocent women and that sort of fetishization of um, the innocence of youth but in a adult female body and we follow these two doctors as they both effectively fall in love with the female protagonist of this story who is the Frankenstein's monster but who also has her own hopes and dreams and leaves behind these two men to explore her own story so in lots of ways it's very different from Frankenstein but it's drawing on those themes. It's also predominantly set in Glasgow in historical 19th century Glasgow. It's really well written. Alistair Gray is a really interesting writer who I really need to read more by and it's a book I'd also like to reread to reconsider and think more on because it felt like there was a lot going on there. There's also some elements of satirical humour in there. Then the book I would say is probably the most firmly in another genre as well as historical fiction and that is Kindred by Octavia E. Butler. This is a book that I'm pretty sure was also in my top 10 sci-fi novels of all time but I felt like I couldn't make this video without including it because it reads like historical fiction. It is very much sci-fi because our protagonist is a young black woman living in the US during the 1970s I believe it is, which is when this book was written, but who gets sent back in time to the antebellum south, so when slavery was still rampant across the US and because she's a black woman without any papers she has to live the life of a slave in this period. So yes there's that sci-fi element because she's being sent back in time but the book very much feels like it's about the past and when she's there there's no science fiction elements, she is just there and she has to exist and she has to live and obviously there's a question of how she got there but that's not the main point of the book. The main point of the book is this 1970s woman's perspective on life in the antebellum south and it's really interesting because it feels like it is a window into the antebellum south from a more modern perspective but then equally because you're reading it now it's got that added historical layer of the 1970s and also touches on the um, racism that was a part of 1970s America and the forms that that took. Now it wasn't historical for the 1970s because it came out then but now as a reader in the modern day you've got those two parallel time periods. It also does not hold back on the realities of slavery and the incredible cruelties and violence suffered by the enslaved so it does very much delve deeply into that but I think it's such an incredibly unique and informative and compelling novel that I would recommend it to everyone even if you don't necessarily go for sci-fi because it reads like historical fiction if you can get past the fact that she's sent back in time. My next one although it's not a time travel novel is one that plays with time and parallel time 
timelines because this is a novel which has both a narrative set in the present day and a narrative set in a historical period and that is Bodders, and that is Bodies of Water by V.H. Leslie. So in this one the setting of the novel is the most important place really. It is set in a building situated on the outskirts of London next to the River Thames and this building used to be a water treatment facility which was another place that women who perhaps were suffering from hysteria or what uh, that society at the time deemed hysteria were sent to be treated. Another way of incarcerating women who didn't necessarily adhere to society's norms or who had mental health problems that society didn't know how to deal with. And it is now a block of flats, so in the present day timeline when it is being converted into flats and we have a young woman move into them. So we follow a young woman in the present day who's recently gone through um, a breakup that is moving into a new flat and who's going through something emotionally and mentally because of that and then we also follow a young woman who has been sent to this water treatment facility because she is a lesbian and her family have found out and obviously that is something that was a massive no-no in that time period and they were perfectly able to send her away to this place because of it and there is a bleeding through of the earlier time period into the modern time period and we sort of see that slight like eerie sense of the past working its way into the present for our current day protagonist but we're also invested in the life and the story of our historical protagonist. This is another one that's super short, really quick to get through but also really beautifully written, really gorgeous prose that you cannot help but sink your teeth into and get completely drawn into. The atmosphere is so rich and the characters are so fully rounded despite the length of the novel. We then last but not least have a middle grade novel so all of these so far have been adult novels but I had to include this because it is definitely one of my favourite pieces of historical fiction regardless of age demographic and that's The Mysterious Howling by Mary Rose Wood. So this is book one in the Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place series which is one of my favourite middle grade series and it's also a middle grade series I've read entirely as an adult so I can recommend it very firmly and strongly from an adult perspective to other adults. I think if you just want a fun adventure as an adult then check this out. It doesn't matter who it's aimed at and then equally if you know any um, younger children who are looking for something to get their teeth stuck into, this is such a brilliant series. It's about a young governess who's fresh out of school and on her first ever official role as governess, her first ever job, uh, where she is in charge of three young children that are the wards of a lord and lady. So these are not their biological children, these are actually three children that were discovered in the woods by the Lord of this manor house and appear to have been raised by wolves. Now the Lord of this manor house just finds that absolutely hilarious and fascinating and thinks because he found the children on his land they're basically his now so why not take them in and, and get them a governess and she basically has to simultaneously train them how to mind their P's and Q's, how to use the right forks at dinner, how to speak and read Latin but also how to just be a little bit less wolfish. There is small elements of the fantastical in these books that become more prominent as they follow on uh, from book one but it also feels very much like you're reading historical fiction in a fun and whimsical way that can appeal to all ages. I love these books, they are so comforting, heartwarming and genuinely compelling. Like I find myself turning the pages so quickly, so desperate to find out what's going to happen next in them. But those are my top 10 favourite historical fiction novels. I hope you've enjoyed this video, I hope that there are is a recommendation in here for you because there are a few different things and maybe something that you haven't come across in the past. I would love 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 to hear from you what your favourite historical fiction novels are particularly if you think they touch on themes that I would enjoy let me know in the comments down below and until next time happy reading and I'll see you all again in the next one.